Welcome, Oakland Ace fans across the globe. My name is Dale Tafoya, and it's Monday, March 4th, 2013, and this is podcast number 107. After being acquired by the A's during the spring of 1987, Dennis Eckersley rejuvenated his career in Oakland and pitched nine seasons for the A's. The first half of his 24-year career, he won over 150 games as a starting pitcher. The second half of his career, highlighted by pinpoint control and intensity, Eckers became the most dominant closer of his era, saving 390 games. He's the only pitcher with 100 saves and 100 complete games. He captured the AL Cy Young Award and MVP Award in 1992 and was a six-time All-Star. In 2004, he was elected to the Hall of Fame, and a year later, in 2005, the Oakland A's retired his number 43 jersey. Today, we're remembering the Dennis Lee Eckersley era of A's baseball. And joining me to relive those great years with Eck in Oakland is longtime columnist for the Bay Area News Group, Carl Stewart, one of the most respected in the country, and he knows his A's history, too. Carl, thanks for joining us. How's it going, Dale? Great. You, you know, Carl, before we get into the early years of Eckersley, I mean, what a great story on and off the field. Yeah. Eckersley's, Eckersley's career took off so dramatically when he came to the A's before the 1987 season. Sometimes we forget that he was already 32 years old, had two all-star games under his belt, including starting one for the AL in 1982, had a no-hitter. What was so compelling about X career, Carl? Well, I don't think you find another guy in baseball like Eck, a guy who had... Uh, you know, he started 361, or, you know, he start, He had uh, um, over 200 starts in his career. And uh, by the time he came to the A's, a lot of people thought he was done. I mean, uh, he was, he, he had struggled in Boston. Uh, he was, uh, uh, his, uh, in 1983, his ERA was 5.61. Uh, he, he, he was a notorious party animal. And I think that got around, uh, uh, he, uh, a lot of people thought that he'd lost a lot of his stuff and, uh, a lot of people thought he didn't care about baseball that much. And, uh, by the time he was with the Cubs in 80, 86, he was, he was viewed as kind of a, kind of a has-been. And when he came to the A's, basically reinvented himself uh, uh, one spring training. He, he was projected to be, you know, one of the candidates to be a starter on a pretty bad A's team, but he probably not, wouldn't even have, wouldn't have made the rotation uh, and decided reluctantly to go to the bullpen where he found that his uh, ability to throw strikes uh, was best suited. And um, it's, it was a happy accident, and I think the A's helped him along in finding him, finding his new direction. But to have a, your first half of your career as a starter and be modestly successful and then looks like your career is winding down, and then to restart your career in 1987 and, and then have another 11 years, basically, um, and put together one of the best uh, relief careers of anybody in history. Uh, that story hasn't been told by anyone. I mean, it's just a remarkable story. And he not only cleaned up himself as a pitcher, but he cleaned up his life as well. Um, gave up drinking and, and uh, uh, straightened himself out and became a model baseball player mm, for us all to enjoy. That story truly is, is remarkable. And it was pretty fitting that Eckersley – rejuvenated his career in Oakland. He was born there at the Oakland Naval Hospital on October 3rd, 1954, and he was raised in nearby Fremont, class of 1972 at Washington High School, where he also played football as a quarterback uh, in addition to pitching. He has an older brother, Wally, sister, Cindy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis was the second child of Wally and Bernice Eckersley. What can you tell us, Carl, about X childhood growing up here in the East Bay? Well, he and his brother were really close, and they were both good athletes and uh, both good baseball players. And uh, uh, I mean, they were the classic suburban family, uh, the Eckersleys. And uh, you know, it came up 
through Washington High. They both came up through Washington High, and uh, Dennis uh, attracted a lot of attention from scouts because uh, he, he not only uh, you know had great stuff and could throw strikes. I mean, he, he had this fire to him, and he had a personality uh, about him that uh, was noticeable even back then. I never saw him pitch in high school, but uh, I've heard a lot of great stories about you know how a lot of the bravado that we saw on the field uh, in in the days with the A's, uh, that goes all the way back. I mean, he was always a, uh, a performer as well as a pitcher. I mean, he, he really got into it. You know, he let his emotion show on the field and sometimes they spilled over a little bit and, and he also wasn't afraid to say what he was thinking. So, um, there, those were memorable days in Fremont and, uh, he, he uh, quickly, once he finally signed, he, he, he turned into a major league career fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. At the age of 17, he signed, and he was drafted by the Cleveland Indians, and he made his major league de debut at the age of 20 in 1975. Mm -hmm. and, and, Carl, many described the 20-year-old Eckersley at the time as a brash, cocky fi fireballer who partied like a rock star. And, and it's, right. it's, it's interesting because alcohol was a big part of, of the major league culture back in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, I mean, Bob Welch, Eckersley's teammate at one, one time, wrote right. a book in 82 about his alcohol problem. What did you know mm -hmm. of, of Dennis Eckersley uh, of the 70s, Carl? Well, I saw him pitch a few times uh, uh, when he was with Chicago and also with Boston, but uh, he was a good pitcher. I mean, I think a lot of people felt like, and, and he was a workhorse. I mean, he, you know, he blogged... Uh, you know, he'd logged 30 starts a year, over 200 innings. Uh, he won 20 games once. Uh, he finished fourth in the Cy Young balloting uh, one time. Uh, his first year in Boston, uh, first of all, with Cleveland, I mean, he was play he was playing for Frank Robinson. I can, o can only imagine what those uh, how Frank reacted to Dennis Eckersley because Dennis had the, the long, flowing hair and, and <laughs> mustache even then. Right. And uh, so – to see him even in his wilder days playing for Frank, that must have been something. In fact, I, I should probably ask Frank Robinson next time I see him about what Eckersley was like playing, you know, playing in those days. And he, like you say, I mean, he was young still. I mean, he, he broke in with the Indians at age 20 and uh, went 13 and seven with a 2.60 ERA. So he, you know, he showed his stuff early and, you know, he, he, he was a, a solid pitcher solid starting pitcher for the better part of 10 years uh, with Cleveland and Boston. Sure. And I know, and I know the, the, the Eckersley and the, the theme of, of his career, I believe in life is how he overcame obstacles. And in 1978 was a big turning point for Eck because it was a big wake up call as he described it because he's been very transparent about about his obstacles and he was going through some alcohol issues and, and he was going through a serious experience in his personal life that year. On March 30th, 1978, he found out that he'd been traded to Boston and the same day, and this is not gossip, this is all over USA Today, it, it's not no news and he's very transparent about it. Um, his first wife, Denise, told him that she didn't love him anymore and in June he learned that she and his best friend, Rick Manning, a Cleveland outfielder were having an affair, and later, of course, they became uh, they were married. Rick Manning and his, and his ex-wife. Uh, just the op op obstacles that he overcame, overcame, and and uh, I mean that could drive anyone to the bottle. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. I mean, it almost plays out like a movie. I mean, uh, you know, your best friend, ball player, you know, takes up with your uh, with your wife, and. You know, I think X life was spinning so out of control at that time that, uh, you know, that marriage was on the rocks anyway. But to have it happen in that fashion uh, gave it some, uh, you know, almost kind of like uh, TMZ type of appeal in the media during those days uh, when those types of stories weren't nearly as prevalent. So, um, yeah, I think it was, I think it hit X really hard. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, he went through several years of uh, battling, battling alcoholism. And uh, he's told me some incredible horror stories about, you know, how, how he, how he fell off. I mean, he, he feels like, 
he could have been one of the best pitchers in baseball and showed it at times uh, uh, as a starter. But, you know, just he was burning the candle at both ends and his career suffered as a result. It was probably the best thing. I mean, and, you know, and of course he winds up in Chicago, which is one of the great party cities uh, uh, in the United States uh, for ball players, And that's where I think he finally came to the realization that, you know, he, he needed to straighten himself out, particularly when the Cubs basically gave him away to the A's. Mm-hmm. And and um and Dennis, you know, he's the first one to tell you that he's he's one right now, and he's open about promoting his recovery. He talks about it, and um, he's promoting it too uh, everywhere he goes. You know, you know, a major theme, Carl, of Eckersley's life and career, and it's no secret. It's about his sobriety, and he will tell you, you know, he battled with alcoholism. And back in the seventies, Scotch and sirloin wasn't just a restaurant; it was the diet of choice for big leaders. And after mm-hmm. much, uh, much denial, in January of 1987, uh, he enters rehab, spends about a month there. And uh, on his decision to get help, Dennis told Sports Illustrated, and I'm going to quote this, that was a very frightening moment, the best thing I've ever did, but the most frightening moment of my life, end of quote. Mm-hmm. And, and the timing of that couldn't have come better for the A's because they acquire a, a sober, determined 32-year-old Dennis Eckersley coming from the Cubs on April 3rd uh, of 1987. Well, uh, I, like I said, I've always called, called this the happy accident because I think it was. I don't think the right. A's had <laughs> any idea what they were getting uh, with Eckersley and to the, to the point where there was a question whether he was going to make the team in 87 uh, before spring training started. I mean, he was there, but only because they, you know, Tony Larissa and, and Sandy Alderson were looking for rotation depth. And Eckersley was definitely on the back end of that. I mean, as I recall, I mean, uh, they, they were, they had trouble finding starting pitchers. So, uh, but it looked like Eckersley wasn't going to make the staff. So they, they moved him to the bullpen and he started getting some results and working with Dave Duncan, they refined, his best strength, which was throwing strikes and throwing hard and, 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 and just not fully around with the bat. I mean, they, they had guys in their bullpen who were walking people like crazy and, uh, actually didn't do that. Mm-hmm. And plus he had this swashbuckling mentality that he took to the bullpen that really served him well. I mean, uh, talking in an era where we had the mad Hungarian and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, kind of, kind of fit him pretty well, and he, like I say, he went there reluctantly. But after he did it for a while, and he saved some games, and he and he found some success, that you realize fairly quickly that hey, I can embark on a second career here. I don't think he had any any idea that it would evolve the way it did. Right. Um, the other part of the happy accident is that the A's were developing a juggernaut. I mean, they had all this offensive talent coming up. Uh, like you say, they, they acquired Bob Welch and uh, put together a, a dynamic team of, of all kinds of characters. And that definitely fit in there really well with that group. Right. That's a happy accident. And it was also, I mean, just perfect timing. And, and Eckersley himself would tell you that he felt the demotion, the, the you know, move to the bullpen was a demotion. And he was at right. the twilight of his career. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. And there were, you know, he wasn't the only guy on the A's who were, you know, uh, resurrected his career. I mean, Dave Stewart uh, sure. at the same time did, did that. And, and Welch, to an extent, as well. I mean, Welch, Welch had gone through some rough times with the, with the Dodgers, largely because of, of his own problems with uh, alcohol and his life kind of falling apart. But, uh um, yeah, and I think they developed some really good friendships there because of their prior issues, and I think that gave that team a bond in addition to its talent that drove it to, to the heights that it got to. Mm-hmm. And, Carl, let's talk about the uniqueness of Dennis, uh, the tan, the rock star, long <laughs> hair flopping with every pitch. 
the perfectly manicured mustache and, and his infamous colorful vocabulary. You know, he called a fastball cheese, a curveball yacker. You know, he, he coined the phrase walk-off piece. He truly was a character in the game. Oh, yeah. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, uh, and probably the best thing I liked about him was that he was a stand-up guy. I mean, he, not every game was perfect. He gave up some home runs. Uh, he'd lose a game on occasion. Not very often, but he was there to tell you how he screwed up, if, if he screwed up. And he would often, often do it in those colorful terms. I mean, um, he was always there to answer questions, even after he gave up that, that awful home run to Kirk Gibson in the World Series. But to this day, I believe, changed that entire World Series. Uh, uh, he owned up to it. And uh, as, as he's often said, that you know, my mistake wasn't throwing a home run pitch to Kirk Gibson. It was walking Mike Davis. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the character of Eckersley, uh, like I say, could, could be a movie. I'm not sure who you'd get to play it, Eckersley, other than that. Because, like mm-hmm. you say, he was so perfectly manicured. He's a handsome guy. Still is. I mean, the guy is... Um, guy's in his 50s now and he still looks great i saw him i've seen him a couple times in the last year and uh, he's still the same guy and he's also a guy i I feel like if i need to know anything about the history of the a's or just maybe a comment on the a's i can give him a call he's a he's a guy who's always reliable and calling me back Mm -hmm. yeah you've developed a a kind of connection with Eck over the years as well i know um you know, I've read some of your pieces, and then just a real great guy dealing with the media as well. Right. Yeah. And I think one of the, one of the nice things I was I've been able to do in my career is that I got to go to Cooperstown and follow Dennis throughout that entire weekend when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame with Paul Molitor, wow. and uh, it was uh, it was a great weekend, and uh, Eckersley was fabulous told a lot of great stories, gave a great speech, and it was just great to see a local kid who, who had been through all that he'd been through walk up on that stage with the greats of the game in a place where he really belonged. And uh, it's one of the most unique stories I think you're going to find in baseball history mm-hmm. uh, of a talented guy who, who went off the rails, pulled himself back together, and developed a a Hall of Fame career as a, you know, as a, as a starter at first. I mean, it, I mean, his credentials as a starter probably helped get him in. But if he had just started his career in '87 as a reliever, I, I'm convinced that he probably would have made the Hall of Fame just based on his relief career. Mm, that's a, that's a great point. And, and you know, we we talk about. Um... Game one of the 1988 World Series, and and talk about a, a test. You know what he what he's going through in his personal life, and maybe wanting to return uh, to it because of such a, a, a impossible moment as Vin Scully described it uh, in the 1988 World Series uh, in Game One. The A's, of course, are up four three in the bottom of the ninth, and Eckersley comes in for the save while Kirk Gibson is limping to the dugout. Eck uncharacteristically walks Mike Davis, a 200 hitter. And here comes pinch hitter Kirk Gibson with a 3-2 count. And Eck throws him a backdoor slider. And Gibson proceeds to deposit it uh, to the right field bleachers for the win. Such an iconic moment in baseball, Carl. And to see the expression on Eck's face as he followed the flight of the ball. um, But just him being able to overcome that moment and not let it follow him and paralyze his career. Because, I mean, you have guys like, you know, the late pitcher Donnie Moore in the 86 playoffs when he gave up that home run to, to Hindu. Um, it looked like he couldn't overcome what happened, in, you know, in the playoffs that year. Well, I know that he took it hard. I mean, he took it really hard because, uh, tell you a story, when I, I, actually, I was at the game, and we, uh, a number of us have actually gone down into the bowels of Dodger Stadium uh, to get in the eighth locker room to write about their win. And you know how accurately when he pitched the ninth, you better get downstairs. You're not going to get down. You better get downstairs in a hurry because he, you know, he didn't waste much time. Fortunately, there was a, a little TV and there was a little entryway that we could watch uh, the game a little bit. 
And we saw on TV with the uh, back to Davis. I mean, he he got squeezed a few times, uh, and he got squeezed against against Kurt Gibson a little bit. But it's still one of the most incredible moments I've ever seen uh, uh, watching baseball to see him give up that home run. I mean, I mean, Gibson could barely walk. I mean, he never he never had another at bat in that series. I mean, he was really seriously hurt. He, and uh, had he the only thing he really could have done is hit a home run because uh, he couldn't run. So uh, see that happen. Uh, I know in, in retrospect, Eckersley has always talked about, hey, I'm in the Hall of Fame. Where's Kirk? You know? right. uh, and I think the proof of the pudding is that sure. a year later, the guy's getting the final out in the World Series. And he, you know, he actually came back in 89 and had – one of the most incredible years a pitcher has ever had. Sure. I mean, um, his, I think his ERA was 0.61, <laughs> something like that. Right. I might, might be getting my, my uh, years confused, but uh, uh, he came back and was actually even better. Right. Uh, and, and was good for several years, even as the A's kind of deteriorated in the mid nineties. Yeah, in uh, nineteen eighty nine he had a one point five six ERA. Wow. <laughs> and uh, was just unbelievable. Right. I know in ninety two he won the uh, AL MVP and and uh, and the MVP award and and right. uh, it's nineteen ninety yeah nineteen ninety right. yeah ERA of 0.61. Wow. And he walked four batters in 70 for innings. I mean, that's, that's insane. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that, that pinpoint. And he played 48 control. games. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's impressive. And, and that it, wasn't even his MVP year. I mean, no. uh, you know, his MVP year was, uh, you know, 92 when he had he won saves and a 1.91 ERA. Mm-hmm. So, Pretty incredible. There haven't been many relievers uh, <laughs> that have been MVPs, but he, you know, he, he was just that five-year run. He was just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And so, you- and able to watch. And uh, I, I distinctly remember one game. I don't even remember who it was against, but I remember going down behind uh, the uh, screen there at the end of the game and watching Eckersley. Pitched the ninth inning, and it was it was like a, a, when you pitch a nine hundred in bowling, or you throw a nine hundred. He he had these three batters through nine strikes, three strikeouts. I mean, I, I've never seen that done by anybody. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm sure that wasn't the only time that he did it. Yeah, just a strike throw machine, Dennis Eckersley, and you know we talk about the the iconic uh, game one of the 88 World Series and I'm glad you brought that up about his quotes about Kirk Gibson because I'm going to give you a quote that he told uh, the Associated Press recently Uh, this is uh, about Kirk Gibson this is Dennis Eckersley and uh, I'm going to start the quote he Gibson had the moment which was a wonderful thing for him and for the game of baseball Eckersley told the Associated Press but it's it's like have have a nice life Kirk I'm going to the Hall of Fame. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that line a number of times, including in Cooperstown. I mean, up there. I mean, uh, it wasn't a, uh, a vindictive type thing. I mean, it was just. I mean, it's just, I got mine. I mean, I, I mean, I think he. The fact that he could put that event in context of, of his career and say, "Okay, it was a bad moment, but I had a lot more good moments." And. Uh, I had a career that that very few of the players have ever had. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, like I say, I, I don't think anybody's had a career where he started out as, as a premium starter and then finished it as the best reliever in the game. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about X final season with the A's and his departure uh, in the spring of 1996, Carl. Uh, he earned $2.8 million in 1995, and the A's ended up trading him to the Cardinals for reliever Steve Montgomery. And uh, that was the time there was a changing of the guard in ownership, and a lot of familiar faces went elsewhere. Terry Steinbach signed with the Twins a year later. 
Ricky Henderson signed with the Padres soon after that. Mike Bordick left. McGuire was traded in midseason in 1987. The Haas era of A's ownership was done, and the new owner, Steve Schott and Ken Hoffman, came in and immediately wanted to cut payroll, rebuild, and run the A's like a business. Uh, did Dennis see the writing on the wall and realize it was, it was time to leave Oakland and just to embrace a new chapter in his career? I think so. I mean, well, he was he was 40 years old at that time. I think his career was winding down. I mean, one of the things that, you know, was the hallmark of that really, you know, he had that pinpoint slider, but he could also spot his fastball really well. And the fastball, he kind of lost a few miles an hour on his fastball. He couldn't set up that slider as well. He could still throw strikes, but people were hitting him all over the yard. And I think he might have called it puts after that 95 season. Uh, but, you know, Tony Dorosa went to St. Louis, and he, he and Duncan coaxed him into coming there. And he spent a couple of years there, and uh, that didn't go so well. And then, but he still had 66 saves for the, for the Cardinals in 86, sure. and 97, at age 41 and 42. Sure. And, you know, his final season, you know, with Boston, I think he just wanted to go home. You know, he, you know, he lives in the New England area, and, uh, going to give it one last go around, uh, you know, at home. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but yeah, the A's were falling apart in 95. I mean, uh, ownership changed. Even Larusser was leaving. I mean, uh, sure, it, yeah. it, it had happened a slow ebb over two or three years. And Eckersley was actually one of the last guys to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was kind of a shame to see the way it all you know, fell apart, but that's kind of the nature of A's history. I mean, they, they build up these great teams and, you know, ultimately they are dismantled mm -hmm. and that's kind of the legacy of the organization. Uh, hopefully we'll keep this current group together uh, for a while now and uh, we can have another uh, renaissance, but uh, it's going to be tough to replace that particular era. I mean, uh, which was, was so much fun, and Eckersley was at the center of it, no question. But when I still I still see all those guys around the ballpark. I saw Mark McGuire at the World Series last year and, and talked to him for a good half hour about the good old days. And uh, uh, there usually was an Eckersley story. I saw Bob Welch last year, and you know we talked about Eckersley. And, uh, I see Dennis from time to time. I mean, I feel really connected to a lot of those guys. Uh, even Conseco, I mean, uh, uh, who, who was probably the biggest character of them all on, on that team, and uh, yeah, that was a great team. They were they they were so much fun to watch, uh, and uh, it's it's pretty unbelievable that all those people came together at that time and were managed by maybe the best manager in the history of the game. Sure. The voice you're hearing is Carl Stewart, great columnist for the Bay Area News Group, and and before we let you go, Carl. Uh, if you were a publisher or, or director of a movie, we talked about a movie about Dennis Eckersley, such a compelling story. And if you were a director or publisher and needed to come up with with a title that best symbolizes the career of Eck, what would you name that book or movie? Sorry oh, to put boy, you on the spot. It would, <laughs> it would probably be uh, something relating to uh, Eckersley's slogan or, or his uh, jargon, you know, uh, something relating to uh, a yak or, or cheese or, you know, <laughs> something like that. I'd have to think about that one for a little bit. <laughs> but uh, uh, knowing Dennis, Dennis, I mean, Dennis would have to play himself, first of all. And then he would probably have to supply most of the dialogue because some of the stuff that he says is just off the, so off the wall that you couldn't think of it uh, yourself. So, um, but yeah, great guy and, and still a great guy. And, you know, you, He's done some broadcasting. He's pretty good as a an analyst because he tells it like it is, just like he did in those days. I mean, uh, and of course, he looks great on camera. <laughs> and that's funny you say that he could play himself because when I look, think of Dennis Eckersley, uh, it looked like he can he could just slide in that movie and play himself and and be credible doing it. <laughs> yeah, he'd probably give it a try. Right, <laughs> knowing Dennis. <laughs> right. That's Carl Stewart, one of the best columnists around. I'm Dale Tafoya, and thank you for listening as we celebrated the career of the man they call Eck, Dennis Eckersley. Thanks for listening, A's fans. And, Carl, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dale.